Hey, hello. Welcome to episode number 48 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choi. Uh, what's up? So this week's something that I love is uh, brown shoes. Like boots, sneakery, high top brown shoes, ones like those. I got these Vans and Rockports, but I gotta get another pair. A new pair of casual, multi-purpose brown footwear. Soon. Anyway, for more about this podcast, check out peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's peoplewelovepodcast.com. The Instagram handle is peoplewelovepodcast. And you can find me on Instagram as well, Adam Choit, my name, if you want to follow me, too. And remember to tap subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And of course, five-star positive reviews on iTunes are greatly appreciated as well. So, today's guest is former child actor, now turned stand-up comedian and podcast host, Mitch Holloman. Mitch tells me the story of how he went from booking TV commercials in Florida to moving to New York and eventually to L.A., where he landed the role of Jake, the six-year-old son of Reba McIntyre's character on the sitcom Reba. Mitch was on that show six years. Later on, after seeing his friend, comedian Victor Trevino, perform, Mitch was super inspired and eventually found his way into stand-up comedy as well. But that's just such a rough outline. Mitch's story is really a journey, and he tells it best. So let's just get into it. Here's Mitch Holloman. So it's good to see you today, Mitch Holloman. Oh, it's so lovely to see you, Adam. Is it? Is it really? It sounded I, a little sarcastic, no, but you meant it. I know you meant it. It's just, I, as I was saying hello, I started to notice the artwork around your home. This is not a home. This is a studio. This is a studio? It's good to see you today in the studio, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I love your artwork in, in the, the studio, studio yeah. your lovely studio artwork. My grandfather painted all these. Yeah? He did. Wow. Yeah, he passed away about 11 years ago, and my grandmother... uh who's still alive she's 99 she just turned 99 and she was on the very first episode of this podcast and uh she talked about my grandfather and those and that's who painted these paintings wow yeah sam robinson that's right that's his name lottie sam robinson, robinson. Like, that's right no i i like the paintings ones of like uh i mean how do you just we should just describe the ones of ones like a still life but of paintbrushes Right. I got to say, my favorite, uh, they're all kind of still lifes, I yeah. feel like. Uh, my favorite, though, is the one right above your head. Yeah. We've got, uh, it's it's lovely. It's just like of a kind of like a uh, a shelf and then some things hung on a wall. We've got a, a small replica boat. Why don't we get into your life? <laughs> and get, we, we can talk about art some, some other time. So uh, I see here on Wikipedia that you were bar- born in uh, Auburn, Alabama, but you didn't, you didn't stay there long. And isn't that love? How I love having a Wikipedia page. I can't figure out how to edit it because I've been trying to add in my death for so long. Yeah, and I see pranks on Wikipedia. It shouldn't be like hard I'm, to do. If anybody knows how to edit a Wikipedia page, yeah. please kill me. What day are you gonna die on? Um, six nine slash twenty sixty nine. I would. I'd like. <laughs> If we could, if somebody could put in that I died in nine uh, eleven, and it's just been a Mandela effect. Oh no! Um, that I uh, was ever on a TV series. Yeah, that would be perfect. I don't know about all that. I'm gonna let somebody else handle that. I don't think I regret that. I know you said I had like editing privileges over things I regretted, but I'm gonna. No, so far you're good. So far you're good. But tell me about tell me about moving from from. Auburn, Alabama, where you didn't stay long and you headed to uh, Florida. Well, one of like the earliest things that I can remember is that I like I always wanted to be on TV. Even I, when, like how from when you were how old? Like from I've been told from as young as two, but I can remember as young as four being like, I want to fucking be famous. What well, famous a- and on TV like but not were those even one famous the same? as much as like I wanted I just loved TV I didn't understand the idea of fame at the time yeah so I'm saying famous now right like, gotcha as like, because it's a funny fun word but no at the time I saw TV and I was like that's I want to be on that thing I like that what were you watching do you know what did you, did I would you be obsessed with like commercials and shit like yeah, okay. I would it wouldn't even have to be a TV show or a movie like I would the Maybelline commercial I would yeah, like maybe it's uh, Maybelline maybe she's born with it yeah <laughs> have you ever considered that huh maybe it's all natural 
That's funny. You just, so you just you just wanted you like to watch TV. You just were just very mesmerized. Yeah, by television. Absolutely, I loved it from the time I was. My earliest memories are of loving TV and wanting to be on TV. Did your did your parents just let you watch a lot of TV when you were like? It sounded like, or did you just you just loved it? No matter. I mean, my mom wasn't. Uh, not any more or less than other kids. Well, the thing is, is uh, my mom, I don't recall my mom being crazy strict about it as long as it wasn't like super late. But also most of my memories of that, like when I was very little, I, I'm sure she was a little more strict about the amount of television sure. that I watched. But most of my memories of that was when I technically had a job and was like working on a set most of the time. So if I wanted to watch TV when I was at home, my mom was like, okay, yeah, cool. That's different. You that, can do that. That's not taking work home with you. That's a different thing. That's yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay. So so how do we how do we get from from uh, from just the young infant basically liking TV and being obsessed and wanting to be on it to being on it? Uh, my I mom suppose. was uh, you know like born and raised in the South her whole life. Every member of our family has lived in the South their entire lives just like generation after generation of people staying within like three or four states close to each other and so she didn't know anything about tv or how to get somebody on tv and that wasn't really a concern to her but she did love florida and she wanted to live in florida so we did um my dad was not like in the picture at this point. By the time I was, like, two, my parents were separated. Okay. Um, and my dad was in Florida, like, working, doing some shit. And we were also in Florida doing some shit. I don't know exactly. But one day when we were at the mall, this lady came up to my mom and was like, Hey, your son's super duper cute. I'd like to put him in this uh, acting convention where it was called AMTC. The Acting, Modeling, and Talent Convention. Very on the nose. Yeah. Honestly, saying it out loud now, it sounds kind of scammy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want your your three-year-old to be in the uh, Acting, Modeling, and Talent Convention. I think you can only call it that if it's kids, but I think it doesn't It doesn't quite sound right for, for anyone. Uh, yeah. What should it be called? We can we don't have to we can work on this some other time. <laughs> I I immediately do want to give it a sexy name now that you've said that. But it wasn't just for kids either. It was for like uh children up to like middle aged people would be doing it. And basically they had apparently like actual reputable talent yeah, agents like a who would come to show, scout. Yeah. yeah, they would like scout from around the area, like maybe I think they would do uh, Georgia and Florida is where the two places that they were scouting at that time. And you would do a convention, and at the end of it, uh, you would either get picked by representation and get to meet with them or not. And I got picked by somebody. What What did they, before we get into it, what did they, what was, what actually went went on at these conventions they you like read lines you acted you danced you sang well, you had was talk had interviews Q&As. acting modeling and talent so you would there would be like uh the commercial segment where you read like um like a triple A car insurance is the best insurance. If you're in need or broken down on the side of the road, like you just have to be like and super you're animated. Five years old or something. Yeah, and the way they do this too, it's fucking wild. Is they have you go into a little audition room and you audition on camera, but that camera is live streaming to uh like a ballroom in a hotel because they hold these things all at hotels to. Just a full fucking audience of at least hundreds of people Whoa. watching you on this massive screen Whoa, that's... live doing your commercial audition. Wow, that, I've and never then... heard of an audition being <laughs> yeah. done that Convention. Way. Yeah, convention uh, style and audition. Then as soon as you finish that, then you go out into the little, you get to leave the room and go back out into the ballroom audience and watch all the other people do their commercials. That's bizarre. How about... The, 
do you, do you recall watching other people's and what did you, yeah absolutely what did you think when you were watching other people oh uh, that i was way better yeah did you have any other <laughs> did you have any other thoughts besides that where it was not really. It yeah. was, I mean, I was so young when I did this. Yeah. I was, I don't think I was even quite four years old yet. Damn. I was oh, like three years than... old. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and then there's, uh, I guess you go as a part of whoever your talent scout is brings you almost as like a team who like there's teams of different people who come from places. So you model with like your almost like troop of people. So what's, when the, you do, yeah, what's the modeling portion? What do you have to do? Uh, well, you one of the things something? we did was we all dressed up as bikers. Um, and we went out on the runway to a wild thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm like fucking three years old. Yeah, like, that does seem pretty cute. Can we say fuck? Because that, I've said it so much yeah, no, already. Well, I don't understand if why you, pe- why would, oh, I don't know why people don't assume that you, if you assume cursing if not otherwise. That's what I would assume. Um, but uh, so at three years old, I'm in the. I've got the, the full little, like biker gear on. I've got a leather vest on. I've it's got pretty glasses. cute. I don't. I'm a guy. Oh, it's I don't always precious. describe things as cute, but yeah, that's. I've got uh, a bandana tied around my head, um, and we like. I walk. There's a, a little girl with me who's dressed like exactly the same, and we walk down to the end of the runway and like put our cross our arms and put our backs together yeah. and look out. I'm picturing right as it goes. Wild thing. I think I love you. And then we walk back, and that was our that was our runway yeah. portion. That's uh, that's that's kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah and i guess the main thing i'll it, buy whatever product that's for and that's like the thing with like this with like the modeling section and the the uh acting section with stuff like this if you are three years old the main thing that they're looking for in you is the ability to uh take direction yeah i was gonna say that that's like gross. they're not expecting a star to shine or any genuine talent to come out at that age at all. If you are able to walk down a runway, cross your arms and lean back to back against somebody, an agent is going to be like, dope. Cool. Yeah. That yeah. kid will follow directions. Yeah. And you're, cause you're so young. You're not yeah. like seven, you're three and a half, four yeah. years old, whatever it is you're saying. Like that's crazy young. I didn't take direct. I didn't take, probably take much direction from my parents even at that age, let alone <laughs> some of the camera. I was uh, an incredibly obedient child. Yeah, Were which you? was ideal for the acting world. Yeah, and now you don't seem as obedient. But we'll get into that. I I like to think that I'm I'm I still follow. I don't jaywalk. I still yeah, follow there you the go. Rules. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Okay, so you got that. You got the, uh, they chose you. They interviewed. They wanted to move forward you with that at the convention. Yeah. And what happened? And uh, I, I, got, uh, I got representation through it, and I started doing commercials a lot. They do, like, a good bit of commercials in Florida. So I did one for uh, Burger King at the time that they were doing these Rosie O'Donnell toys. And that's a which, national, th- that's yeah. a national, th- is that the yeah. first national thing that you or you're not even sure. I don't know if that was the first national one or the one because I also did one for uh, Nick Jr. Do you have all these on tape somewhere? Or- My mother has uh, literally a chest full of VHS tapes of every really? single one. Of D- these. Does she, yes. does, has she had these converted? Uh, I she like tried to get some of them converted to DVD yeah. at some point, but there's so many of them. I don't think she's taken the time to she get them all converted. She should, now. and then you could you. I mean, you they're probably pretty <laughs> as the as precious as that's you know and hilarious and entertaining. I kind of want to see some, yeah maybe not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> the Burger King one. There's a good many. Um, but yeah, no. So I did the one for Nick Jr. and I think that might have been the first national one, but. The Rosie O'Donnell thing, because the Burger King one was like Rosie O'Donnell toys, and that was very special to me because uh, I, as a young child, uh, loved Rosie O'Donnell. Yeah. I don't know why. She grew up the next town. She's from the next town over. On the really? Island from me, uh, Comac, yeah. She's That's... from the, ne- the next town over. <laughs> I've got like... We're not for the same age, obviously, but... <laughs> I've got... So, like, the one of the things, too, that, like, my mom was kind of concerned with the the acting thing so uh after i'd done some commercials uh my agents in florida were like you've got to take him to new york 
that's you can't like make any real money out here or get any real jobs in florida and they and that's like was it was that i mean you're not you don't know that you weren't there but like was that do you think that was the sentiment like you gotta do like really strong arming is that the right your mom or trying to like uh well there's some of that they think? weren't they wouldn't have been representing me even when i went to new york they no longer represented me i was uh, would have been leaving them as an agency and they were like no, oh i like, see they're like they're like you yeah, gotta know they're like they're it's not about us you gotta get this kid out of, out of here yeah they were like you have to go to new york i see you'll book way more out there and my mom's uh sentiment at the time was like my kid just made like college money and we have been a poor family forever. Yeah. Like, we're not, we're not going to fuck this up. We just made, my kid can go to college now. That wasn't even in the cards before. Yeah. Um, so Rosie O'Donnell, we were like watching the show and there was a, a point. Her daytime talk, yes. talk show. Yeah. My mom was watching that and there was a point in it where she like told the story of, uh, how she had always told her parents as a child that she wanted to act and they like wouldn't let her do it. And uh, there was just something about that story that my mom was like, okay, well, if he really wants to do this, then we'll go and give it a try. You so, wanted to go to New York. You were yeah, going. I was like, fuck yeah, yeah I want to go to New York. I want to get out of Florida. Yeah. I've never liked the South. Even it, when you were, even when no, you, were, you, knew I was you wanted to go with there. You, yes, I didn't when you were like five years there. old, four years yes, old, you knew my you... earliest memories are loving television and hating Florida. Yeah, that's. <clears throat> See, I don't even remember where would I want to go if I didn't grow up where I grew up. Not that I loved, you know, everything about where I grew up, but I can't even like, I, I wouldn't know where to go. <laughs> I guess, I guess because I grew up near New York or in New York. So there's that. Yeah, right? Like you can, <laughs> there's you that. already got one of the cool places. Yeah, I was right outside New York City. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, so we went to uh, New York, and I was there from four years old to five years old. And actually on my fifth birthday, we went to, because every now and then my mom thought it was pretty cool that they filmed the Today Show uh, like live out there and you could go and stand Did outside you live and in, be in you the You lived audience. in Manhattan? Yeah, we lived in like that, this shitty little tiny studio apartment in Manhattan. But you're Manhattan. still in Manhattan. Just me and my mom. I had uh, an older brother, but he stayed in Alabama with my grandparents okay. while we were in New York. Um, and yeah, it was just me and my, me at four years old and my single mom. And we would every now and then go to the, uh, like, you know, they would tape the Today Show, like the sure, outside yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. She would yeah, like to just go to that every now and then. Um, I was booking a, a good many commercials out there. Uh, there was like one for a migraine medicine. Uh, one for Colgate, what some you, other stuff I don't remember. What do you remember, if anything, you know, because, again, you're young, but, like, about being on set and the performance, the job, like, the acting itself? Do you remember, like, being fun or challenging or having any weird experiences that were one more notable job than another? I mean, obviously, the Burger King, Rosie O'Donnell thing was important to you. But. Yeah, no, for me, it was, uh, I mean, when you're a kid on set, I've heard plenty of horror stories, but for the most part, when you're a kid on a set, especially on commercials, they are just trying to get you on the camera for the couple minutes that they actually need you on the camera and then get you back to the studio teacher uh, or whoever is on set to let you play with your coloring books. Yeah. Like, there's a good bit of it is downtime where sure. you just get to hang out and color, especially at that age before you have school. Like, I didn't have to do homework on set or anything like that. So if I wasn't acting, which I loved to do, I was playing with something, which I also thought was pretty cool. So it was always a positive experience. Yeah. That's cool. Um... When I uh, turned five for my fifth birthday, we went to uh, the the Today Show taping, and my mother had made a, a big sign. She had taken, you know, like the the shitty the blinds that are just like the the flat panels that slide across, yeah, you know, back and forth. You know, they'll have those big long plastic sticks that you can turn them. Like yeah, you can open the blinds and then you can pull the blinds with the stick. Yeah, she took that off of our blinds 
and then uh, cut out a big five out of yellow construction paper and used it. Like she glued that to it so that it was a handle for the sign. Yeah, I follow. And then she uh, she cut out rainbow letters that said, uh, I'm five today in this big sign. And we went to the Today Show and got interviewed by Katie Couric. Wow. And Katie Couric asked me what I wanted for my birthday. And I told her I wanted to meet Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> is that even is that the same network or is that a different was that my um I, I don't know. I forget. I think it might have been it, it was NBC. NBC yeah, yeah, it absolutely was because, Good job. Good because job, Rosie Kate. had those fucking NBC koosh balls. Yeah, um Yeah. Uh and so I guess for uh, conveniently Katie Kirk was going to be a guest on Rosie O'Donnell like the next week. Wow. And she was like, okay. And Katie Couric got me tickets to be in the audience of Rosie O'Donnell's daytime talk show. (laughs) And in the middle of it, Rosie O'Donnell uh, pointed to me and said I was really cute and then called me to come on stage. My mom has the the VHS tape of this, too. Yeah. And Rosie O'Donnell picked me up and held me in her arms and (laughs) and asked me some questions about about my life. (laughs) I'm not going to I'm not going to hold you in my arms. I'm just gonna, but I will ask you questions about. I mean, your, your I'll sit life. in your lap. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I meant all of that. All of that. None of that is happening. <laughs> oh wow, that that's pretty incredible. And you must have thought thought that at the time. It was there was like a number of things that happened in my childhood that give like that gave me. Like there are people who like suffer from delusions of like grandiosity. And I, I certainly do on some level, but there were things that happened in my life. Yeah. That I, that like, I, it's valid that I have this delusion. You, no, those are, those are, uh, you're not the only one in this, in this town with, with some of that going on. <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> it's okay. No, that's, that's, that's amazing. So then did Rosie, o, ha, Rosie O'Donnell hire you to work? Yeah, no, uh, I, I was, uh, <laughs> I got hired on as a staff writer. <laughs> there you go. See, I don't just act at Fike. I come a I'm a writer too. I uh I also I did like a super duper small role on The Sopranos when we were in New York. Um and then I booked right like right when we were supposed to go back to Alabama. I booked my first TV show that I was 5 years old and it was called Daddy O starring Michael Chiklis who um He was in this show that was called The Commish. That was like one of his earliest roles that nobody alive now knows him from. I recall the name of the show. Your grandfather loved it. I promise. Um, Mine did. Uh, But uh, Michael Chiklis played a stay-at-home dad. And so the show shot in Los Angeles. And that's how I came out here. Why were you going to originally go back to Alabama for school to start kindergarten or something like that? Uh, no, my mom had been six months away from her oldest son. I see, yeah. And to, to uh, she was, we had made a good, good bit amount. of money. Yeah. She was more than satisfied to bounce. Do, do, were you, what were you thinking at that time? Because there was, a, was there a period where you guys were like not sure whether you're going to go to New York? Back to Alabama or, or to I LA. genuinely like Don't I remember my what. memories of that t- like that specific event are almost non existent. For me it goes from auditioning in New York to being on the show in LA. Yeah. All right, tell me about the LA thing. Uh, LA life. It was awesome. We well, I mean, we first moved into Oakwood. Which yeah, is Burbank Oakwood right, apartments. Yeah. yeah. It's uh it's no longer called that, but it was like this uh, weird little black hole that every single person who moves to LA to act winds up having to live at. For yeah, some why? Because <laughs> it's it's like a big complex. I think yeah. there's just a lot of housing in that particular area, and it's a good location. It's and they'll central. host they they have a lot of acting classes there. It's located in a place that's good for like auditions everywhere. It's right, like right off of the yep. the 101 to go down to Hollywood. Like you don't even have to take the 101 to go to Hollywood from right. there. You can just go right over Coanga, and that's fucking awesome. But, uh, so I lived there, made some friends there, was on the show, and 
I loved being on a sitcom so much. That was like, I, I loved commercials. They were so much fun. But then like being on a, a show weekly where you got to have a dressing room. And then at the end of every week, at the end of uh, like after we would tape, you know, once a week we would tape the episode, uh, there would be one of those, uh, you know, those straight up dollies that just uh, like for carrying boxes, like big ass boxes. Yeah. Uh, everybody at the end of tape night would put me on one of those and like well, they would do a conga line around the set and push me on a dolly. Yeah. It was awesome. I was five. I was uh, having the time of my life. Again, the delusions of grandiosity are completely yeah. justified. Yeah. No, that sounds like, I mean, that's exciting for anyone of any age, let alone a kid. Push me around on a dolly right now. Fucking right? go for a ride. Sounds like a good time. It's never not a good time. Yeah. It's for it doesn't even have to be a dolly. You can be on anything with wheels and for somebody to push you in it is an awesome time. I was just watching a train, a Christmas setup, a Christmas wintery setup, a train going around. And that was that I just just the train going around, that was like an that was, that was pretty good right there. Like, you just have to be exposed to the idea of it. And yeah. it's you're <laughs> right. lit up. Right. Wow. So yeah, so that sounds that sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, that show taped for a season and then got canceled after five episodes airing. Was that devastating to you, or you just kind of did you understand the nature of the business at that age? Even well, I was. I didn't really have time to feel it because within a week of getting the news of that show ending i went on an audition for uh the show called at the time it was called Sally that was what it was called and um i booked that like pretty much immediately so i didn't get the time to even feel That's what it awesome, was like man. to have your show canceled and we shot the pilot for Sally it Got changed. The title got changed to Reba because it starred Reba McIntyre. That makes sense. And they realized, why the fuck are we calling it Sally? <laughs> what? <laughs> why are we gonna waste Reba McIntyre by calling the show Sally? Fair enough. Uh, and it got picked up, and that was awesome. By that time, we had moved from Oakwood to a place also in Burbank called Park Point Apartments. It's uh, right over on, oh, God, it's Hollywood Way, and... You don't live there now, yeah. so you don't, you don't have to go back yeah. there later. You're yeah, good. totally. Don't right? worry about it. That's not your home now. You're Thank okay. God, because I'd not find it. <laughs> Google it. But, yeah, um, so then that show was picked up, and that was fucking awesome. So you were how old that you were... I was now six years old, like, just turned... When we shot the pilot, I was six, and I think once it got picked up, I was seven. I think yeah. I, like, just turned seven when we got picked up. For for how many seasons or year? Like It was, was on for six years. But, yeah, so when they when it got picked up, did you know how many... Was it a certain amount of seasons that they, or episodes that they ordered? No, or? when it got picked up, I think we were just only... a full season. I think it season. was like for... We might have been picked up for two to three seasons, possibly, but I genuinely, like, I didn't It's know. awesome. It was all I just awesome. knew that we were shooting yeah. it, and then the next season we got to shoot it again, and then we got to do a few more, and that was awesome. It wasn't until... We got, uh, on the sixth season, we were, we had, I think, a 20-episode order, and then after, like, a couple episodes, they were like, hey, what if you only did 13 instead? And we were like, oh, for sure, it's over. Yeah, but before then, what do you, what do you remember about, like, the cast, the crew, the job itself, <coughs> the day-to-day -day I mean, life? everything. That was my, like, where most kids grew up going to school every day. I grew up going to set every day. Did you have any ed education? Like, did you go yeah, to school? Yeah, absolutely. The that? majority of my time, I had uh, a studio teacher the whole time. So anytime I wasn't... Uh, actively shooting a scene which was a good bit of the time, a lot of downtime, time children yeah. on sitcoms are treated kind of as uh props <laughs> you know 
Uh, not actually, no. A lot of sitcoms now, uh, they like uh, use the kids, uh, the like for really great storylines, and the kids you know, are also but good. You actors. don't even really mean that as like a negative, like as props. No, just, no, no, just no, like not they're not used. They're trying to limit their usage because they're yeah. kids. Well, and for our show is even though it was a quote unquote family show, a lot of the issues it dealt with were like kind of mature and adult. Like the the pilot episode is about uh the the teen daughter having to get married because she's pregnant like not the most controversial thing now but in 2001 it was for reba mcintyre to be doing a show about yeah. that was kind of something and not something that had a whole <laughs> lot of room for the little boy the, si- yeah. the six-year-old little brother yeah so it was just something where they kind of used it as a just just to kind of compliment the episodes every now sure. and have the I would like run in the room and say something cute and funny and then run up the stairs. Yeah, I ran up the stairs a lot. <laughs> and it sounds that, that's like perfect for you know what you probably enjoyed doing as a six year old. You're that acting. Was great. And you're I running. did. I loved. I did. I did get really excited to run up the stairs. I would race. Sometimes they'd have to be like, "Hey, buddy, slow it down." Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, no, so uh, a lot of it I, I spent time in my 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 school, which was just a little trailer right outside of the set. And after I had like for first through like third grade. Well, first grade I did on the, the first show Daddy O, and that was It was first grade, but then like second through like fourth grade on Reba, I had a pretty strict teacher uh, who was incredible. Her name was Ruth Ann. She was a fantastic teacher. Um, And then after that, I started getting way less strict teachers. And I started learning that uh, I'm a really fascinating person to talk to. And the more (laughs) I could captivate my teachers with uh, stories and talking... The less I would have to do any schoolwork at all. I can see that. It was awesome. Yeah, (laughs) it was was... so great. Yeah, yeah. You needed you needed the strict teacher. What was the most? What do you recall from this time? Like working on those those two shows, Uh, Reba especially, uh, being about being the most like challenging part of of either your work life, your work life, or your you know your life life. You know, was it was it balancing school and the the job was it being you're not having time for friends was it uh you know your mom and not having a lot of time for herself and her life being you know challenge what was what was the hardest thing about uh i mean challenges? i feel like or was it all great i i feel like the like it's not the answer you want to hear but for the most part it was all really great i'm sure i can't speak to what it was for my mom sure to go through um but she had come from like a, a working class background in life. Like we had lived in a trailer before, like when I was born. Sounds it's like a like better life for both of you. That's my awesome. mom will will uh, let you know that it was a nice trailer, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, but she insists it was a nice trailer. Um, but so it was. It was definitely like a very different experience for her. I. I, I I guess, yeah, there was times. No, honestly, I always had time for friends because I had a schedule that I knew and my schedule was pretty much the same as their school schedule. So I got done with, uh, there was only one day of the week that we had to work at night. And during that, uh, I loved that day. That was honestly my favorite day of the week. We had a live audience and also there was this guy in the commissary who made the best grilled cheeses and he knew as soon as I walked in, like he would just start making the grilled cheese. I didn't even have to order it, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Did did any of the kids treat you differently, or or strangely did you notice because you were on television, or did you not notice at anything all. like that? And I think a lot of that too is because we live in LA. Like right, I like my next door neighbor. His, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My two best friends, like one of their dads was a a movie producer of like really big movies. They're like, around it. Who produced. 
way bigger stuff than I would ever have been in. Yeah. And oh, Reba Show, that's nice. Yeah, that's, no, that's like, nice, son. <laughs> like he didn't. My neighbor, my friend, who was my neighbor, didn't give a shit that I was on Reba because he hung out with Jaden Smith uh, while his dad was working on a movie. So yeah. Like, he was like, oh, yeah, Jaden Smith's cool. Fuck it, Reba. Yeah. I don't care about that. And then my other friend, his dad was a screenwriter who wrote, like, again, really big it's movies. It's not Naples. Like, it's not yeah. Florida. You're not in Alabama. Yeah, no. So, like, most of my close friends were all associated the with business. the business in yeah. some way, even if they weren't directly in it. A family member, like, one of their parents Yeah, they were. they've was. been around it Yeah, it forever. wasn't. It wasn't shocking to them that I was on TV. Sure. They didn't give a fuck about what being on set was like because they had all been to plenty of sets too. What about the rest of your, you know, your extended family and, and maybe people who lived out of state that you know in your life, you know, all your uh, life? They How definitely they- all thought it was really cool. I still, if I, you know, my aunts, my one of my aunts calls me Hollywood. <laughs> I say. believe it. Um, my grandfather was. Like my biggest fan, he we had uh, there were these uh, baseball caps that they had put the Reba logo onto that they gave to the cast and crew one of the seasons, and my mom mailed that to my grandfather, and he fucking wore that shit every day of his life <laughs> after that. My grandfather wore that Reba hat till the day he died. He's to buried the point in point that my mom had to get him another one because he had worn out his first one. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, my family, like, they all thought it was very, very cool, definitely. And at this point, too, uh, my brother had come with us. When we moved to L.A., my brother moved with us. Nice. So that was cool. So what happened after uh, Reba? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I started the show when I was six years old. And yeah. then the show ended when I was, like, either, like, just about to turn 13 or just had turned 13? Not that you grew up on the show, but you've done a lot of growing up. I did grow up on the show, though. Like, that was kind of, like, I spent... Your voice was... Did your voice um, change by the end of it? Yeah, no, totally. My voice was broken, and I was also always such a small child. Like, up until 13, uh, like, at 13, I was still very small for my age. And then at 14, I got, like, became, like, a normal size I'm still not a big guy, yeah. but I'm not little anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the show ended, and the first thing I wanted to do was, because I had always had to have my hair cut in the same exact style for the show. <laughs> you had the same haircut uh, for yeah, six years? For six fucking years, I had to have the same haircut. What about that when you, when you weren't shooting? I, that would only be like a tops five-month <laughs> period. I could grow my hair out a tiny little bit, and then as soon as we got back, they would cut it. Yeah. And uh, so my first thing was, like, I want to grow my hair out, and I grew it out to below my shoulders. Damn. Um, And also, I had had at this point, like, the weirdest Hollywood experience. I don't like saying Hollywood, but, like, I had gone from, I started as, like, a little boy, and I started doing all these commercials i got a bunch of commercials why do you why do you describe it as weird though what do you mean well just because at at that time it was uh not Not a typical childhood is that what you mean no no it's not weird it's um not the typical hollywood experience most people uh, like they'll book here and there but they don't get like as soon as their tv show ends they don't immediately usually book another tv show yeah Right, a lot of people have like a little bit harder time getting started even, out. So. Yeah, even kids, uh, kid, anyone, anyway, actors so, of any age. At that point in time, I had had like this very special experience that was kind of like, uh, you know, not the typical experience, and so I was expecting that to continue. Of course, yeah, I was like, of course, this is what's always happened. I'm just right. gonna keep yeah. getting things, and that's when all of a sudden. It stopped completely. Yeah. I, I kept auditioning for things, but I wasn't getting things. And it got to a point where, like, this thing that had always been seemingly easy and fun to me, I started to resent and was difficult. I was going on audition after audition. For, and I never liked auditioning. I liked acting. Of course. Yeah, what kind of things? I mean, because you were probably 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah. Uh, so roles for kid people that age, well, I'm and, guessing, right? Yeah, it would be mostly roles for people that age. And also, I didn't, like, I looked younger. 
I didn't look quite young enough that they were going to cast me as the cute young kid, ten or eleven, yeah. and like get the extra hours out of me being older because I didn't look quite like that. But I also didn't look like I was fifteen. Yeah, so they couldn't cast me as a fifteen-year-old. There was also less. So it sounds like there was less for you out there, also in addition to seemingly like without trying to find excuses. I also think like a lot of it. I after like auditioning and auditioning and auditioning, a part of me like I kind of like my spirit got a little crushed from that. This was the first time I had actually dealt with denial. I was now. Like, going from just, like, success after success after success, being the cute kid who did the thing and got the thing, to being the, like, kind of weird-looking teenager who was not capable of doing the thing anymore. And you you think that in auditions that the people that you were auditioning for for picked up up on this, that you not were mailing it in, but you just were, you weren't... You're enthusiastic. You were. You weren't, you weren't yeah, enthusiastic. I came in with a complete lack of enthusiasm yeah. about it. I became drained by it. Like for maybe the first couple, I went out excited, and then after that, I was like, "Wait, what the fuck is this real world shit?" And it like it pretty quickly actually brought me down. Like it affected me for sure, and I. That must have been really hard. It was because it's already like. For myself, for pe- most people, of in that's can be that's like the hardest age. I think is like twelve, thirteen, fourteen. That's fucking a hard time because you're not a kid, you're not an adult, and you're going yeah. through this very traumatic, you know, experience of highs and lows. And you're also you're going into high school. That was another weird thing for me is that I was going from having been in my uh, uh, like my my set school. To now, instead of going to an actual high school, I continue to be homeschooled, um, but now actually at home. And it was high school, and my mother chose a program that was completely online. Like, I didn't have a teacher at any point. I never had anybody to explain anything to me. How How come the homeschool, and why not go to public school or- my mother was in is to this day my i have a younger sister as well she's homeschooled yeah uh my mother's like terrified of the school system yeah she was terrified of it way before school shootings yeah no, yeah no she's that's a good that's always a, been afraid of it no that's a good that's that's a probably kind of a good instinct in many ways the program that i that i was doing was also a christian program so there was all this weird shit where like in yeah my, well, but that might not be ideal in I my suppose. science class <laughs> i was now learning that the earth was actually no older than six thousand years old Oh, boy. Like, my science class was like, there's no way. At one point before a science quiz, there was a video that I had to, they wanted me to watch, and I pressed play, and it was a professional baseball player, and he was like, hey, guys, I just wanted to go ahead and talk to you about the mercy and grace of Christ Almighty. This was a science test. Yeah, wow. And a baseball player was telling me about... uh, the love of Christ. Your mom was always religious. Uh, she in like a like pseudo, like in a pseudo religious kind of way, where she adopts her own. She's spiritual about Christianity. Yeah, you know, like the spiritual thing where they pick and choose the things that they like, which like, I guess a lot of Christians do. My mother, a lot is of anyone of does that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it seems like constantly evolving kind of. Yeah, beliefs. and it's a lot of it is because of the she was raised in the. 60s and 70s in Alabama. Sure. Which is a very, very religious, weird uh, school climate. I think it's... I gather. One of the last places that, like, there's still, like, prayer in school and shit at the time, probably. Um, And so the Christian schooling thing really rubbed me the wrong way with that. What about your brother? Did he have to do this? Do the same kind of thing? He did. He went to an actual school, but because he grew up in the eighties and nineties, so he did like some form of like an early form of homeschooling, where he went over to somebody else's house for a little bit. And I think they tried that for like one semester of a grade. And he was like, I'm going back to school with my friends. He was always very defiant. I was a very obedient child. Yeah. So I was going to do whatever I was told. He was uh, going to 
do whatever he wanted. And this now was me being shaped into that kind of person. I'm now being given this religious uh, thing instead of science that I know is untrue. And I'm experiencing uh, rejection for the first time from not like from a girl or something like that. I could have handled that, I feel like, from uh, professional prospects. I'm at 14 not getting the job. And there's something about that that was seriously affecting me. I, yeah, because it was something, it was your reality. <laughs> your previous reality was getting the job and that's all you knew and yeah. that's what you understood and then like to have that taken away is hard especially for a teenager yeah an adolescent whatever you know um but then when i was 14 i booked uh, an xbox 360 commercial with jane lynch who's uh it's awesome she was the, she was from Glee. She played like the I know who I know who she day. is. Yeah. It's funny. Um and this was right before Glee. I think Glee had just been announced. It was going to come out soon. So she was about to become like one of the biggest things in the world. Um and she was so nice and awesome and I met this girl while we were filming the commercial and i got really into her and we became friends and this girl became like my first real like girlfriend who i felt like i fell head over heels for this girl when i was 14 and she had an older sister who was dating this guy victor and victor was so fucking cool he was just the coolest dude in the world What's his last name again? Um, Victor Trevino. That's right. Victor Trevino. And he, um, I don't know. I just, uh, he was one of the first people that I met who I, like, I, there was something about me, like, I imprinted on him. Like, there was just something so effortlessly cool about him. And he was such a talented artist. Like, he was a musician. He would write these really incredible songs you should check him out on iTunes. He has an album called uh, under the name Genghis Kitsch. Um, and he did stand-up, too. And he invited me to one of his stand-up shows. And the first time... How old How old was he? Were you guys the same age? He was... No, he was 21. He was 21. You were Yeah, he was fif- older. You were 15. I was 15, like just turned 15. Okay, and he invited you to a stand-up yeah. show. Well, I was going... He had invited his girlfriend to a stand-up show, and his girlfriend invited her little sister to the sure. stand-up show, and I, being her boyfriend, got to also go to the show. And when I saw him perform, he's like a really alt-comic, too. So I had I'd loved stand-up for some time at this point, but I'd just been watching Comedy Central. I'd been seeing, like, Mitch Hedberg and Dimitri Martin and all these, like, pretty weird comedians who did cool, like, interesting yeah, stuff. Yeah, those guys are funny. But it was just, it was a, a thing, even though I had as a child, seen TV and been like, I'm going to do that. And then I did it. I never made that connect with stand-up watching it on TV, like at all. I just, it was something I enjoyed to watch. I liked to watch it. And that was it. But when I saw Victor perform, a switch just went off. And I was like, oh, whoa, this is like more than just people trying to be funny it's like actually uh, an artistic form of self-expression like you can do more than just like try to be, tell a set dick up joke a punchline yeah. yeah you can actually like you can express your feelings and i was at a point in my life where i was feeling a lot of stuff i had uh, lost this show which, hey, you have a lot to it say had been a few years it had been like a couple of years after that but i was still Even losing the show wasn't the thing that really, like, affected me as much as going on audition after audition after audition after audition. And so that was starting to stew. And so I was starting to feel things and develop my own emotions for the first time. I had uh, my first girlfriend who I had real feelings for. So there were all of these emotions that were bubbling. And now I saw this outlet that you didn't have to audition for. You could just go up there and do it. You could just walk right up there and start talking into the microphone and express 
how you felt, not uh, try to interpret these words on a page in a way that you think a casting director wants. You get to just go up there and spill whatever is bubbling inside of you. And that was awesome. I As soon as I, I went home that night and I just I started writing the the shittiest, not even one-liners, okay. just what I, I thought might be one-liners. And I as soon as I finished writing them, I, I called Victor and I was like, Victor, I, I need you to listen to these. And he listened to every single one of them and he and he encouraged me for some reason. And I kept trying to actually write. And at some point he was like, Hey, you should go to an open mic. And he took me to the haha ha cafe. And I did well. Like it actually like people he waited to tell you. That he waited to tell you that. He, yeah, I, no, absolutely. That, he that's fucking a, waited. That's awesome. You know, yeah. that's that's you know, you know, you respect respect for that. Like, you know, that he he waited till he felt that you were, you know, somewhat ready and yeah. had enough material ready. You know, and to go. I would call him every day with ideas, and he would give me the one thing that I like that's incredible is he would give me an honest opinion. Like there was stuff that I would tell him that he would say, you know what, buddy, I, that's not funny. Like it's actually not. I I I get what you're trying to do, but I I don't think there's anything with that. And I know you are funny, so you should go try something else. Yeah, that's a hard that's a hard thing for someone to hear because it's not like he can even give a specific because there's not always a specific yeah. reason why a joke might not work. It's like, oh, if you change yeah. this word or deliver it in a different way, sometimes it's it's just like and there were that's just not that's just not that, funny. But there were times that and. <clears throat> Thank God he did, because there was stuff that I thought was funny that once he told me that's not funny, I looked at it again and I was like, oh, shit. He's right. Yeah. That's objectively not funny. It's just not. And he really helped me develop a sense of what I wanted to say. Like, I was at first just trying to say everything and all of it. And then he helped me figure out what of that was funny. And then through that, I was able to figure out what's funny that I also want to say and put my opinions on. And what do you remember about those early those early days of doing stand up? And what, what what were some of those those? I mean, even just themes or whatever you want to recall talking about on stage uh, or expressing. I mean, a lot of it, I tried to, I tried to make jokes about having uh, grown up in the South, but I tried to do them in sort of like a dark-ish one-liner kind of fashion. Yeah. So because especially, I I didn't grow up in the South. I was from the South, so I wanted to try and make some kind of humor out of that. I didn't uh, grow up with my dad around, so I tried to make some jokes about that. But in like. Like one was uh, uh, my my father uh, had a, a drinking problem, um, you know he uh, it's he he quit he quit uh, drinking uh, three weeks ago. Two weeks ago he died of dehydration, <laughs> and that was just like the weird little like I would try to take like themes from my life, sure. And then try to turn it into some just kind of little one-liner. That was when I thought I was I was going to write one-liners, and that was going to be the kind of comedy that I did. Hey, you're finding yourself. Yeah, and that was uh, was great. And Victor would take me to open mics, go to open mics with me sometimes. Uh, he was super fucking helpful in the early stages. I loved it so much. I, I guess one of the things I remember from that the most... Um, was finding something that I was passionate about again because I guess like I was truly as I was when I was younger passionate about acting. I loved it. It was a thing that I loved. I loved to do it. I loved to be on set and I still love to be in front of an audience. That's one thing that I will always love. But this was something that I found that I I got to fall in love with something again and that was what I remember from the earliest like That's cool. Days of so you were doing it throughout high school throughout yeah. your high schooling your homeschooling and it was pretty inconsistent at that time i i was only doing it um i would do maybe an open mic every month like one a month and then that's still not 
bad. Uh, you're, I mean, you're just a high school kid, but nevertheless, you know, at least you're, yeah. you're doing that. And then I was doing like every four to five months, I would get like a real show. And I got to, when I was like 16, I got to do a show at the, I got to do some shows at the stage two at the Ice House um, in the smaller room there. I got to do one where uh, uh, Kyle Cease was the headliner, who I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's uh, not a comedian anymore. He's a like a, a self help speaker, like a, a okay. <laughs> He's like a speaker now, but he had like a, a comedy album that I really really enjoyed when I was a teenager, and so it was a show I was excited to get to do. Sure. Um, by the time I was eighteen, I got to do uh, a show in the the original room at the comedy store and open for Brian Callen, who had also been a guest star on Reba at one point. Did you guys didn't remember each other? <laughs> I remembered him <laughs> because I like, I was a little kid and he was like this weird, funny dude who came on. Yeah, the show, I got so you. He was impressionable on me for gotcha. sure. When I told him about it, he was like, Oh, ha, ha, cool. <laughs> he didn't remember. <laughs> no, not at all. I don't think he remembered being on that show. Yeah. Even though he was on it multiple times. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's funny. Did you talk about any like, uh, risque blue material cursed on stage a lot because i'm it's because i i'm picturing a little bit of that with the stand-up and then like thinking about how you're doing a christian online homeschooling so i'm I'm, is there is there a weird dynamic with doing stand-up i going to christian doing the christian homeschooling thing there wasn't a weird dynamic for me because the it was most of the classes i could finish in about 20 minutes like they were so simple and stupid yeah the baseball there player. wasn't yeah so <laughs> i i wasn't really investing a lot of time or thought into this christian high school experience it was just kind of a, did you learn anything no, academically dude, growing up no at, not at all no. because you had one dis, one teacher that sounded like they were good and they were the disciplinary but all your other like onset teachers sounded like they were terrible and they just were charmed by this little cute kid telling yeah. them stories i will tell you and then this. you did the homeschooling and that just that sounds like an also also an epic disaster uh, have you learned any do you, have you learned anything my gpa is 4.0 <laughs> in what in, in where to high school yeah, are they online? The uh... yeah, but they sent me a diploma. <laughs> they, 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 they sent a PDF uh. <laughs> attachment. Did you did you go to college? I am applying. You're applying right now. Yes. Wow, that's awesome. That's yeah, exciting. I just uh, I took after high, well because I actually I graduated early. I the thing is is I don't feel like I ever learned anything in school, but uh, like. I didn't have to do the fifth grade because I got to take a test to see if I was uh, smart enough to just skip the whole grade or have to do some sixth grade work in fifth grade. And they were like, oh, you don't you don't have to do fifth grade. You know that shit, which not like the biggest grade in the world to skip. But so I did get to graduate a little bit early from from high school Oh, from high school. Well, just because I was already ahead ahead a little bit. So, um. Yeah, once I was out of high school, I was just pretty grateful to be done with school. And all I wanted to do was, even though I hated it, I still desperately thought that I could book something. Right. So I did want to, there was a big thing, especially like you, if you uh, are 17 years old and graduated high school, which I was, you are slightly more attractive to book because you are like legally 18. Once you're done with high school, you can work as many hours as necessary. So that was something I was like, maybe now I'll get booked on something because of this. So I was pretty excited to not do college and just devote myself to something artistic. And it wasn't until pretty recently that life broke me down enough to make me want to. <laughs> Were you doing uh, stand up th- when you kind of first made this decision or whatever? When you just, you know, or not decision, but, you know, went with this path that, or whatever? Did you. Were you doing stand up at, you know, into your early 20s? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I did it up until 18. And then I took just like a couple of years to kind of lose my mind. Yeah. Uh, and then at 22. 
It was like all right before I turned 22, I got back into it and I've been doing it uh, consistent. That was when I started doing it really consistently going yeah. out a lot, getting booked on shows a lot, trying to host shows, meet more comedians. Are you, are you still acting? You still want to act? What's the no, latest? No, I have not. No, I have not done that since I was 19 at 19. That's I, the last audition you went on. Yeah. I did a short film that was, God awful called Bus Driver. It's on YouTube. It's, <laughs> I was terrible in it. It's a terrible movie. I will say this. I thought we were making a comedy. <laughs> if you watch it, please know that I thought we were making a comedy. <laughs> um, oh, no. And I have done a couple more small things since then, uh, like in the last... Uh, available upon request that's the thing is i've had people like ask me like hey will you do this project for right. me and i do like to act that's the you thing. don't like to audition i it. hate auditioning and you, and you know but i don't mind being on set i like being on a set for a little bit that's a fun experience for me i don't care about ever becoming an actor again but i won't ever turn down the opportunity to be on set <laughs> yeah what about your like i was gonna ask and this is kind of what i ask all all my guests is like what is the long term like dream or goal or plan like obviously why don't you tell me more about the what you're going to plan on studying in college and what where you're applying and all that but like as far as like you know comedy do you want i mean you said you, you're kind of getting away from acting but what about what if it's your show what if you're you what if it's your sitcom you know and, and you're I the mean, star that you're writing and whatever i do i love to is i that really enjoy writing and what i would like to do eventually is uh make some kind of films there's like some ideas that i've been trying to write and work on potentially being able to produce in the future but they're just kind of stories that i want to tell not anything that i want to ever really expect anything to come from gotcha it. passion um, projects you're yeah i really really enjoy writing and so i'm going to be going to i'm applying to uh study journalism um, really? digital journalism and media production. Uh, and I'm going to do it online. <laughs> but that, you know, you're, it's, you're, you're saying that with a, with a smile as if there's like, a, you're, get, you're, you're skeptical of yourself. It's the but only it's not, but school no, this, that I know. Yeah. It's the only thing that I know. I could never go to a real physical school. It's just, it's not the environment that I'm capable of learning in. But you're choosing what you want to learn this time. Yes. Which and I think is important. From a reputable school. This uh, I'm applying to a Penn State has an online university yeah where uh their degrees don't even say online you just like it looks like you went to Penn State yeah. which is awesome that is awesome so and they let anybody <laughs> yeah cool you're anybody yeah. you fit you but, fit uh, in that uh category <laughs> and the reason I want to do that is because especially like with the podcast that I've been doing and a lot of the stuff I've been doing I found I really, really do in love. I really, really enjoy like investigative journalism or just investigating things. Feed that, and feed that, my like friend. That. And since again, I love writing. I would love to write and produce films. That's not the kind of thing that you typically get a degree in. So by getting a degree in journalism, I am both learning journalism and uh, taking some course in writing. So I'm now learning another writing approach. I've read a million scripts, so yeah. I know how to write those. Now I get to think of it with another mindset. You'll also get a lot of stories from being exposed yeah. to the journalism world that could be potential inspiration exactly. for Exactly. So I feel like it's narratives. something... I don't feel like it goes against my other plans. No, it doesn't have to be one thing. Yeah. That's awesome. So why don't you tell me about the, the podcast and uh, and whatever else you want to promote, upcoming shows, anything like uh, that? And, uh, what's the podcast called? And uh... um, Well, uh, my podcast that I co-host with Kyle Anderson and Gracie Todd is called Extremely Internet. It's available on all the things. You can find us anywhere. Uh, we deep dive, I deep dive into a story <laughs> from the internet, just something weird. Like, uh, one of the stories we did was how, uh, the guy, the people on the website, it's mostly guys. They're mostly monstrous men. I believe um, it. On the website 4chan, 
just ruined Shia LaBeouf's life while he was trying to do an art piece. They stole his flag. They yelled Hitler did nothing wrong in his face. Just a bunch of terrible things. And we chronicled that and talked about it. Just anything that the internet has done terrible, we are going to talk about. Yeah, I trust your instincts to be able to yeah. find those stories and choose the 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 right ones as well. Um, and uh, we're working on putting together a YouTube. So please uh, check out Extremely Internet on YouTube. I'm very excited about that. You can also follow us on Instagram at Extremely Internet or Twitter at Extremely Net Pod. Um, and I also co-host a show with Grace Todd called Really Very. And we do that every month. It's the last Friday, the last Friday of every month, except for December. We are doing Friday the 13th. Oh. That one we're calling Really Merry. Sir. Our Christmas themed. Oh, M E R R Y. Yes. You. Yeah. <laughs> no, M A R Y. Like it's the, religous. Yeah. Adam. Well, you never you're getting back you're to your getting roots. Getting back to my roots. roots. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> um. But yeah, please uh, come out to it. It's in Burbank. You can follow it on Instagram at Really Very Show. It's a lot of fun. Adam, I love. I met you because of the show. It's a and fun show. You've been. So wonderfully supportive of the show. I love you. Have I think been to the most of them out of anybody? We've only done six so far. We've only been I think doing I've been to three. <laughs> exactly. You've been to <laughs> half, half of our time. shows so far, which is amazing. Yeah. You even you came to our Halloween show in costume, which yeah. is something I didn't expect anybody it's the, was going to do. The, you have the right. It's the right price. I. It's free, <laughs> and I I give away booze. And candy. Yeah. I should include that. Yeah, please come to the you, show. It's you can free find it, and all this information on the, on the social media. And where can people find you? I'm at Mitch Holloman on everything. Uh, you can just you can Google me if you want to. Please edit that Wikipedia page. <laughs> really, he wants you to add his death date. I'm really trying to be murdered on cool. Wikipedia. Yeah, six nine sixty nine. That should be your death date. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for dropping by the studio for sure. It's been fun. I've Thank learned you. a lot. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of fun, Adam. Thank you. I appreciate the time again, man. Take care. Thanks for listening. So there you have it. My conversation with Mitch Holloman. Seriously, I hope Mitch's mom can get all those VHS tapes and DVDs and all that footage of young Mitch archived, organized, and available online. I really want to see this young Mitch, Katie Couric, and Rosie O'Donnell footage. For real, though, that was a lot of fun, and I again thank Mitch for his time and look forward to seeing more of his comedy real soon. Anyway, for everything about this show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com. And I think that's about all I got for today. I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks, as always, and let's talk soon. Peace.